Okay, uh, can everyone hear me okay? At the back? No? Oh, yes, great. And, hey, right, okay, thanks for the introduction, Misha. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Misha said, my name is Derek Murray from MSR Silicon Valley, and today I'm going to talk about how we use various big data techniques to parallelize training for one part of Kinect's body tracking pipeline. Now, I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to get to work on a small part of this when I was an intern at MSR two uh, summers ago. Accordingly, this means most of the work was done by other people. And amongst them, Jamie Shotton was responsible for developing the learning algorithm that we used. And I'll touch on some details of that briefly. Uh, Mihai Budiu in Silicon Valley uh, did most of the work in porting the algorithm to run on uh, a cluster using Dryad Link. And Mark Finocchio uh, was instrumental in getting this technology transferred into the product. And the uh, oh. microphone is pulling out. Okay, well. Anyway, yes, the product in question is, is this. Uh, Connect for Xbox 360, uh, which if you haven't heard of it, is a new kind of input device for the Xbox 360 games console, stuffed full of sensors including a microphone for voice recognition, a regular camera for face recognition, and a depth sensor that captures the scene in three dimensions. In this talk, we're most interested in the depth sensor because it's this component that's able to capture you know, your sweet dance moves or whatever and turn them into signals that control what's happening on the screen. So where does machine learning come into this? Well, the problem that we're setting out to solve involves taking a depth image recorded by the Kinect and labeling the parts of that image that correspond to different parts of the body. This brightly colored output is then used to build a skeletal model of the player, uh, which games and other applications can use to perform gestural recognition. So how does the Xbox classify these images in real time? Well, to be real-time, it needs to do this very quickly. And for this, it uses a decision tree, or to be more precise, a randomized decision forest that runs on the Xbox's GPU. And training this decision forest is where we need big data analysis. We use a cluster of machines running the Dryad execution engine and provide it with a large corpus of depth images of various poses paired together with the respective ground truth body parts classifications for those, uh, for those poses. So let's take a moment now and revisit the standard algorithm for training a decision tree. So for some node in the tree, you have a collection of examples, each of which has a class. So here the classes are blue and orange, and there are six examples of each. So to refine the current node in the tree, the algorithm evaluates a number of Just clip in. Should, do you think I should hold it or something? Maybe if I get it vertical, it won't pop out. Sorry about this, folks. There we go. Ah, oh, right. No, it oh, There. Ah, wonderful. Okay. Uh, yes. So yes, we uh, we evaluate a number of features on each of the examples, uh, each of which splits the examples into two groups or more, but we only consider two in this work. And heuristically, the best feature to choose is the one that maximizes normalized information gain. So the examples are then divided according to their value for the best feature, and the algorithm is recursively applied to the groups. So to make this a bit more concrete, the Connect classifier uses 31 classes corresponding to different parts of the body, and 2,000 features which correspond to differences in the depth signal at different positions in the image. So with numbers like those, um, there are many opportunities for parallelizing the algorithm. For example, the simplest thing to do, since we're building a decision forest, would be to par parallelize building the different trees in the forest. However, because in our application there are relatively few trees and each tree takes a long time to train, we didn't bother exploring this option. Instead, we parallelized the independent work done in processing the individual tree nodes, and I forgot to say, but the trees we're thinking of have about uh, are complete binary trees of depth 19 or 20, so they have on the order of a million nodes in them, so there's plenty of parallel work to do. Um, also on the different training examples, which are 
pixels in the context of a training image, and also on the features. So now, as I've described it, the algorithm has a rather divide and conquer uh, kind of flavor, since for a given node, all the work that's done processing its children is independent. However, the number of nodes is so large, remember, around a million nodes, that it would be too costly to schedule a new batch job for each node, and this would potentially require a lot of data to be shuffled around to make the subgroups for each child node. Instead, what we do is we flatten this recursion into iteration and perform the work for one level in the tree in each job, in a single job, rather. So let's now take a look at how a single layer of the tree is processed. So we start with pairs of training images batched together and distributed across the cluster. These form the input to the first step, which, uh, has, which uh, performs one task per batch. And we also pass in the existing tree that we've computed so far as the second input. So what does this task do? Well, the first thing is to transform the set of images into the much larger set of examples. So these are individual pixels. I think we choose about 2,000 pixels uniformly at random from the training images to use as training examples. For each example, then, it uses the existing tree to identify the node with which that example is associated. And you might think that we would keep this around from the previous round, but it's much cheaper to recompute it than to persist it to disk between rounds. And this also gives us fault tolerance. Having associated an example with the tree node, the algorithm then evaluates each feature against the example, so each of the 2,000 features against each example, yielding a direction left or right, depending on the value for that feature, and indicating which of the two child nodes of the current node would receive this example if we split on that feature. And having done that, we emit a tuple containing the, for the current example and feature, the node ID, the feature ID, the class from the ground truth image, and the direction in which the split uh, would happen. And finally, we group these by the key, by node, feature, class, and direction, to build a sparse partial histogram of, um, of the uh, examples. So next, what we want to do is compute the complete histogram for each tree node. So the partial histograms, we repartition them by node ID and sum together the counts for each key. So now we've moved from parallelizing on the uh, training images to parallelizing on the nodes in the decision tree. So this aggregates enough data together for each node to compute the best feature, uh, the feature that has the best normalized information gain. And so the algorithm is able to yield a new tree node splitting on that feature. And now we have a set of partial tree frontiers. From these orange tasks, have computed a new partial set of partial tree frontiers containing the new nodes computed at this round. So the last step in uh, the level of the tree is to merge the frontiers together with the existing tree to produce the new tree for the next round. And having done this, we can pass the new tree back into the same algorithm and repeat until we reach the desired depth. So our clustered version of this uh, was based on an existing small-scale version that used a single multi-core machine to build the tree. And I think it could train a tree to depth 18 on 10,000 images in about a day. Our version could train three trees to depth 20 on 100,000, I'm sorry, on a million images um, in the same time period. So this was certainly worth doing. We used Dryadlink, which is a cluster programming model that was developed at MSR, uh, that uses higher order link operators to define parallel operations on collections and translates these into dryad programs that execute on a distributed cluster. So these link operators are, might be familiar if you're used to database programming, things like select, where, group by, and so on. But they are, additionally, they are strongly typed and they allow programs to call directly into C sharp code, uh, which, in which the, uh, the learning task was implemented. So Dryadlink had several advantages for this implementation. In particular, because the histograms had to be heavily optimized to reduce memory consumption, they were implemented as custom types. And Dryadlink's integration with the .NET type system made it no problem to implement operators in these types. In addition, uh, Dryadlink generates automatically 
uh, serializers and deserializers for these types, which can be tedious and error prone if you have to do it yourself. And the underlying Dryad system provided fault, automatic fault tolerance within a job. So it was able to deal with transient crashes and network out outages, which were fairly common given that we were using commodity machines for, uh, for testing this. Focus in the wrong place. There we go. Uh, so these are just some numbers uh, corresponding to one of the training runs from which I'll now present a couple of graphs. So we had 1 million images in the training set, 2,000 example pixels from each. We were computing 2,000 features, features, which were continuous features, with 50 candidate thresholds for each feature. And just to give some idea of how long the training takes, uh, on our test cluster, training is three uh, this is a different test cluster from the time that I reported earlier, but it takes about, a tree to depth 19 takes about one day. We use more uh, machines for the other tests. Um, the red bars show the number of drive vertices executed in each round, so there's a massive number of processes going on here. And the blue line shows the amount of time spent in each stage. So for the early stages, it was taking about 30 minutes um, for to process uh, a level in the tree, and this increased to two and a half hours as we got to level 19. The large jump in the number of processes at, at depth 10 and 16 indicate where we had to adapt our parallelization strategy. So the accumulated histograms that we were aggregating together were becoming far too large to store in memory. So what we did was to additionally parallelize on the feature uh, evaluation. So we would do this in batches and add another merge stage to find the best feature per node for each, across all of the batches. This graph, I don't know how well you can see it, um, it shows the execution profile for a single level in the tree. So along the x-axis, we have time, and on the y-axis, uh, there is one uh, data point for each of the different machines in one of our clusters. The colors uh, correspond to different phases of the computation. And hopefully you can see a wee bit better if I zoom in. Uh, so if I zoom in this one little detail of the graph, the green, red, and blue phases of, the, uh, of this graph correspond to building the partial histograms for different subsets of the feature. So this is in a later round where the, uh, the histograms are becoming really large. And these phases, these phases don't proceed in lockstep. The amount of work done in, uh, across the training set is different and is quite skewed. But on average, the cluster is kept sufficiently occupied that the skew cancels out. And as you can see, if we go back to the overall view, these, uh, all the machines finish within a few seconds of one another. So as an application, uh, this really stretched the capabilities of Dryad Link, which wasn't really designed to handle this kind of algorithm. So for one thing, we had to uh, work around the performance penalty that Link itself imposes. In order to be maximally generic and to be able to work on any kind of collection, each link operator performs at least two virtual function calls per element. So this, when you have a huge number of elements in the feature evaluation, the primitive computational step is very, very cheap. This overhead began to dominate, so we had to manually inline uh, various operations, meaning we couldn't write quite as pure a link program as we would have hoped to. This actually inspired some uh, separate work on the Steno opt automatic optimizer for link, and we presented details of this at PLDI earlier in the year. Another challenge was that many big data systems are optimized to handle large numbers of small data items, and Dryad Link's no exception in this regard. So this meant that we were often confounded by buffering strategies. For example, uh, when you um, emit records from a Dryad Link operator, the, the implementation buffers them up because usually when you have a few small, few bytes per uh, record, it's wasteful to go to disk every, every time you write that. But when you're dealing with multiple hundreds of megabytes worth of histogram in a single record, you don't really want to be buffering at all because you end up buffering so much that you run out of memory. For this, we had to uh, come up with an adaptive buffering scheme. And we had a similar problem um, doing work sharing between the cores in a single machine. So uh, we had been using the parallel link, which is a sort of automatic uh, multi-core parallel version of link that uh, parallelizes uh, on in-memory collections. And we had to change the partitioning scheme that it uses so that it didn't build up queues of, of too, much, uh, too much data. A third problem was that, uh, our challenge was that um, because these jobs were much longer running than our average job, 
uh, we were starting to see more and more unusual faults. So this, not just of worker machines or the network, but also centralized components might have some periods of unavailability causing the whole job to crash. So to deal with this, we added some checkpointing to the driver program that was submitting each of these jobs. And this allowed us to restart from wherever a computation left off. It also allowed us to change the implementation in the middle of a training run, which in the early days when it was taking much longer was really useful. In this case, we'd be, taking, we'd be starting over from where it crashed because it ran out of memory because we hadn't implemented it properly. Um, but that got better. So I'm nearly out of time. So to conclude, in this talk, I've told you briefly about distributed parallel implementation of decision tree training. It's capable of tra training three 20-level trees on a million images in about a day. Our implementation and all the data types it uses are generic, and it could easily be adapted to other training exercises. But the main idea to take away is that to make this work in a big data setting, you flatten the recursive structure of training into an iterative computation and decompose it into multiple jobs that run on the cluster. Finally, if you're interested in more details about the training pipeline, including how the ground truth is uh, obtained from motion capture data and how the classified images are converted into skeletons, I encourage you to read this paper uh, from CVPR 2011. But at this point, I'd like to thank you all for listening and take any questions you might have. We did, we did, yeah, that was, so that became really important once you got to, I think, depth 16 in the tree. You, you also needed to, put, uh, to partition by feature. So you can't do the data set? No, 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 so the, the, the main data set is just the, the images. We kept the same data set and that didn't change. These were only ever read from disk and never, never written anywhere else. But in your partition dashboard, so did the individual features per node completely so splitting image across multiple machines by features? Uh, right. So the same image would live on all the machines, just Oh, right. Um, so no, we were, it was more, more of a hybrid of the two approaches. So the images would live on, uh, we replicated for fault tolerance. So I think it lived on about three machines. And coincidentally, when we partitioned features, it was into three sets. So that meant that we could, in theory, uh, run those completely independently. Although we tried to keep the cluster oversubscribed so that the performance was acceptable and the efficiency of the training was high. Oh. Uh, so for the bigger data set, I mean, was it, was it, was it, was it how, what was the accuracy change? I mean, it, 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 the accuracy change. Um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. They're in the CVPR paper. Uh, okay, it, it, it improved, certainly, with more images. Um, and the, using the multiple trees, three, I think, was the sweet spot to avoid overfitting. Um, you still saw an improvement up to five. We didn't, but there were diminishing returns. Uh, right, well, it was beneficial from a software engineering point of view. It made it really easy to take this existing solution. It actually was based on, well, there was originally a, uh, just a single process version. Then it, they tried to make a version for MPI.net, which uh, was not working out very well, particularly because we were using these same unreliable machines and there was no default, sort of no automatic checkpointing support or fault tolerance. Um, but the amount of change in the actual machine learning code was very small to move it to a um, uh, to move it to the DriveLink implementation. So we had Jamie, who's a machine learning expert, Mihai, who's a DriveLink expert, who knows a bit about machine learning, and they together were, found it quite easy in a week or so to get something working. To make it perform was more of a challenge. I, that was what I ended up doing most of, finding the, the strange performance regressions and uh, trying, to, trying to hammer them down. Um, but one thing we found is that it was getting so much faster. I mean, we were just, from the MPI version, it was taking a week to do what we could do in a day. So they would ask for more and more. Let's train another level of the tree. You know, just double the amount of data that you're passing around or quadruple it or, you know. Um, and it was mostly in doing that that we discovered the real challenges. Hey.